Vikings. So today I'm going to share with you the story of Marian Anderson, who was a very famous singer back in the 1930s. This is When Marian Sang. No one was surprised that Marian loved to sing. After all, she listened to father singing in the morning as he dressed for work. Mother often hummed while she worked in the kitchen. Sometimes Marion and her little sisters, Ethel May and Elise, sang songs all afternoon. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, Lord, have mercy on me. However, her voice was distinct, strong and velvety and able to climb more than 24 notes. Everyone wanted to hear Marion sing. Alexander Robinson, the choir director at Union Baptist Church in South Philadelphia, wanted to hear Marion sing even though she was not quite eight years old and sometimes sang too loud. He asked her to perform a duet with her friend Viola Johnson. As Viola sang the high part and Marion sang the low, their harmony blended like a silk braid. Church folk started whispering and followed with, followed with out and out talking about Marion's remarkable gift. Neighboring churches heard the news and invited Marion to perform. One advertisement said, come and hear the baby contralto, 10 years old, and people came. So a contralto is someone who has a really low voice. When Marion sang, it was often with her eyes closed, as if finding the music within. Audiences heard not only words, but feelings too. Spirited worship, tender affection, and nothing short of joy. She was chosen for the celebrated People's Chorus, a hundred voices from all the Black church choirs in Philadelphia. She was one of the youngest members and had to stand on a chair so that those in the back could see the pride of South Philadelphia. Her father was proud too, but protective. He didn't want anyone taking advantage of his child. Father's love made Marion feel important. When he died after an injury at the reading terminal where he sold ice, tragedy filled Marion's heart and sometimes her songs. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Mother was happy for Marion's success, but reminded her that no matter what she studied, to take a little extra time and do it well. Marion didn't need extra encouragement when it came to singing. She practiced her part of each song and often learned all the other parts too. For her, music was a serious business and more than anything, she hoped to someday go to music school. Church members promised tuition for our Marion if she was accepted. Since father's death, Marion worked at odd jobs and sang in concert programs in order to help support her family. It wasn't until 1915, when Marion was 18, that she finally went to a music school and patiently waited in line for an application. But the girl behind the counter helped everyone except Marion. Was she invisible? Finally, the girl said, we don't take colored here. Her voice sounded like a steel door clanking shut. Marion knew about prejudice. She had seen the trolley drive past her family as they stood at the corner. She knew that her people were always the last to be helped in a store, but she could not understand how anyone who was surrounded by the spirit and beauty of music could be so narrow-minded. She felt sick in her stomach and in her heart. 
Didn't they know that her skin was different, but her feelings were the same? Couldn't she be a professional singer if she was a Negro? With unwavering faith, mother told her that there would be another way to accomplish what would have been done at the school. Marion believed her mother. She took voice lessons in her own neighborhood, continued with the choirs, and sometimes performed at Negro churches and colleges. When Marion saw the Metropolitan Opera performance of the tragic opera, Madame Butterfly, thoughts of a formal music education came again to mind. How wonderful it would be to sing on a grand stage, act out a dramatic role, and wear beautiful costumes. The passionate music inspired her, and she was determined to study. But opera was simply the sun and the moon, a dream that seemed too far away to reach. He's got the wind and the rain in his hands. He's got the sun and the moon in his hands. He's got the wind and the rain in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. As a young woman in her 20s, Marion was invited to many states to sing. Sometimes she traveled with her accompanist by train, where they were seated in the dirty and crowded Jim Crow car reserved for Negroes. When she arrived at her destination, she often sang the same program twice to separate audiences, one white and one black, or to segregated groups, whites in the best seats and blacks in the balcony. Many times she was welcomed enthusiastically by her audiences and then could not get a hotel room because she was a Negro. No matter what humiliations she endured, Marion sang her heart with dignity. Her voice left audiences weeping or in hushed awe as they strained to hold on to the memory of every opulent note. When Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand, let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Marion still wanted to advance her singing with master teachers. With the help of friends, she was granted an audition with the fierce yet famous Giuseppe Boghetti. When she arrived at his studio, Mr. Boghetti announced that he didn't have time or room for new students. Too afraid even to look at him, Marion took a deep breath. Slowly, with great emotion, she sang. Deep river, my home is over Jordan. Deep river, Lord, I want to cross over into campground. Marion finally lifted her eyes. I will make room for you right away, Mr. Baghetti said firmly, and I will need only two years with you. After that, you will be able to go anywhere and sing for anybody. Again, Marion's devoted church community raised the money for her lessons. Marion worked hard with Mr. Baghetti, and sometimes for practice, she sang, she sang scenes from Italian operas with him. Her recitals now included German songs too, but other languages troubled her. She didn't want simply to sing beautiful words like Dunkel wie Dunkel in Wald und in Feld. I'm not very good at German. She wanted to know what the words meant. That means dark, how dark in the woods and the fields. Other Negro singers had gone overseas to develop their voices and learn foreign languages. Why not her? After all, Europe was different. There, she would be able to sing to mixed audiences and travel without restrictions put on her people in America. Marion needed to grow, needed to grow and mother agreed. A bundle of trepidation and excitement, Marion boarded the Ile de France in October 1927. She had never been so far from her family. She knew her sisters would take good care of her mother, but still she already felt twinges of homesickness. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. 
Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long ways from home. A long ways from home. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. A long ways from home, a long ways from home. Marion studied and was eventually invited to perform in concert halls in Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark. The enthusiasm for her singing was so overwhelming that one newspaper in Sweden called it Marian Fever. Audiences applauded in London, cheered in Paris, and pounded on the stage for encores in Russia. In Austria, the world-famous conductor Arturo Toscanini announced that what he had heard one was privileged to hear only once in a hundred years. Marian felt as if she had finally achieved some success. She even asked Mother if there was anything she wanted that would make her happy because now Marion could afford to buy it for her. Mother said that all she wanted was for God to hold Marion in the highest of his hands. It seemed like she was already there. Mr. Baghetti had been right. She could go anywhere and sing for anyone. Until she came home to the United States. In 1939, Howard University in Washington, D.C. booked a concert with Marian Anderson and began looking for an auditorium big enough to hold the audience she attracted. They decided that the 4,000 seat Constitution Hall would be perfect, but the manager of the hall said it wasn't available and no other dates were offered because of their white performers only policy. Marion's agent, Sol Hirok, wrote to the hall manager, pointing out that Marion Anderson was one of the greatest living singers of our time, but it did no good. Enraged fans wrote letters to the newspaper. In protest, Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady of the United States, resigned from the organization that sponsored Constitution Hall. Howard University then tried to reserve a large high school auditorium from an all-white school, again, they were denied. Now teachers were angry and marched in support of Marion in front of the Board of Education. Washington, D.C. was a boiling pot about to spill over. Wasn't there some place in her own country's capital where Marion Anderson's voice could be heard? Committees formed and held meetings. Finally, with President Roosevelt's approval, the Department of the Interior of the United States government invited, invited Marion to sing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on Easter Sunday. Her country was offering her a momentous invitation, but she had concerns. Would people protest? Was it dangerous? Would anyone come? Examining her heart, Marion realized that although she was a singer, first and foremost, she also had become a symbol to her people, and she wanted to make it easier for those who would follow her. She said yes. Standing in the shadow of the statue of Lincoln, waiting to be called out, she read the engraved words, This nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. Marion looked out on a river of 75,000 people. Her heart beat wildly. Would she be able to utter one note? She took a deep breath and felt the power of her audience's goodwill surge toward her. Marion's sisters were there and mother too. Marion stood straight and tall. Then she closed her eyes and sang. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountain side, let freedom ring. 
A roaring cheer followed every song. At the end of the program, the people pleaded for more. When she became her thought, when she began her thoughtful, sorry, when she began her thought-provoking encore, silence settled on the multitudes. Oh, nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows my sorrow. For almost 16 years after the Lincoln Memorial performance, Marion sang for kings and queens, presidents and prime ministers, famous composers and conductors. She received medals, awards, and honorary degrees for her magnificent voice. But there was still one place Marion had not sung. When she finally was invited, a dream came true. Marion wondered how people would react. No Negro singer had ever done such a thing. She would be the first, but she didn't need to worry. After she signed the contract, someone said, welcome home. On opening night, excitement charged the air. As Marion waited in the wings, the orchestra began. Her stomach fluttered. She walked onto the grand stage. Trembling, she straightened her costume and waited for the pounding music she knew to be her cue. Tonight was her debut with the Metropolitan Opera. At long last, she had reached the sun and the moon. The curtains parted and Marion sang. The end. So guys, I actually, um, we're actually able to um, see the video of Marian Anderson singing at the Lincoln Memorial, which is pretty impressive that we have video of her singing My Country Tis of Thee on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. It was one of her most famous performances in all of her life because it was just, it was something that had never been done before and they were denied everywhere else. So this is um, her actually singing on Easter Sunday in 1939 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. So guys, I hope you enjoyed When Marion Sang. When Marion Sang. It's one of my favorites. Have a great rest of your day and I will see you soon.